Finkelstein and Alan Dershowitz round two on Pierce Morgan. I thought this was a very uh, interesting conversation. There are some funny moments because I just, Alan Dershowitz is horrible. I just, I, I can't, I'm so sick of this guy. I'm so sick of him, okay? <laughs> I've had it with this guy. Let's go ahead and dive in. I don't know why Pierce uh, puts himself through this, but here we go. We are getting started with this port. Wait a minute, did I highlight it? Oh, this part here. Um, do both sides have a legitimate cause for complaint? Let's dive in here. If you look at that in totality, some people have said to me, you know, if you actually go back to this period in time, both sides have a legitimate cause for complaint. Would you agree with that? I can't agree with that because we have to stick hard and fast to the factual record. The factual record is fairly clear on what happened in 1947 to 49 in the case of Israel and Palestine. Roughly 750,000 Palestinians uh, from what became the state of Israel, were either expelled or fled in fear and ended up refugees. Now, it's important to keep in mind, Piers, because you, and I think generously, agreed to talk about the background. Frankly, I think you're the first person mm -hmm. I've noticed willing to talk about the background, that 200 and about 270,000 of those Palestinians who were expelled during the first uh, Arab-Israeli war they ended up in Gaza. So if we want to take the point as a point of departure, 1947 to 49, the point of departure for Gaza is exactly the same. That's how Gaza became Gaza. 70% of the population of Gaza were, became Palestinian refugees. Now, as to the question of what's sometimes called a population exchange between the Arabs who resided in, excuse me, the Jews who reside in the Arab world versus the Arabs who resided in what became the state of Israel. There really isn't, I don't want to again involve now in a scholarly debate uh, because it's simply not the time and place. But there isn't any good scholarship on what happened with those Arabs, Arab Jews in 1948. Some, like the Yemeni Jews, everybody agrees they came willingly. The, the question of the Iraqi Jews, it's kind of a blur what happened. I'm not going to take one position or another on it. But I don't think those other aspects of the conflict ought to uh, distract us from the fundamental question that you asked, and I think it's a very good question, to look at the background, and the background to what happened, what happened on October 7th, it began with the expulsion of about 300,000 Palestinians into Gaza, and now they, comp they comprise about 70 to 80 percent of the population of Gaza and their descendants. Okay, well, Alan Dershowitz, you're disagreeing with, with what you're hearing there. Why? Alan Dershowitz always looks like an angry potato. Like every time I see him, he looks like, like his face kind of looked like a potato. Seriously. But the point that Norm is making there, that's, that's important to know. This is why we continue to say this didn't start on October 7th. And you got to think about it. All those people that were basically refugees in Gaza, right? So then you got to think about the people that were born in that you know, caged in space, that open air prison, how do you expect those people, what, what mindset are they going to have? Like they know that they're basically in prison. They can't move around freely. Like what kind of life is that for someone to have? Fundamentally, the Nakba was a self-imposed wound. Ben-Gurion, when he announced the establishment of Israel, welcomed all the Arabs to stay. He didn't want to expel a single one. But the Arab countries engaged in a genocidal war designed to kill every Jew and destroy Israel. It was as a result of that invasion that Palestinians left or were expelled. Now, I happen to have studied the situation 
with Iraqi Jews, because I was one of those people who helped draft Resolution 242 at the United Nations, and we looked at great detail into the history of Jews in places like Iraq. In Iraq, there was a Nazi pogrom during the Second World War, and there were additional pogroms in other Arab countries in which Jews had no choice but to leave. And there was an exchange of population, much as there were in Sudetenland, much as there were in Pakistan and India, and every other country in the world, the refugees were incorporated, assimilated into the society. But UNRWA, this horrible, horrible organization, was set up to keep the Arabs refugees, to keep them in camps, to make sure there was a festering wound. The Jews were integrated into society. No, they weren't first class citizens in the beginning, but now they dominate the country. The same thing. Pause. Did you pay attention to what he just said there? He said, no, they weren't first class citizens in the beginning, but now they dominate the country. So I don't know if that was a slip of the tongue or if that was intentional or not, but that's Alan Dershowitz admitting to you who is in power. So this is why when people try to put the Palestinian people and the Israelis on the same level, you really just can't. So there's that. He's talking about the food. He's talking about UNRWA. Again, notice how he's trying to blame the oppressed for their own oppression. That's what he's doing. Pay attention to that, folks. People did the same type of rhetoric, right? People did had the same type of rhetoric during slavery. They had the same type of rhetoric during Jim Crow laws. That's why this is so incredibly dangerous. You cannot blame oppressed people for their own oppression. That is what Alan Dershowitz is doing. This guy is very trained. He has been a trained liar. That's why you keep seeing him pop up everywhere to debate the subject. It could have happened to the Arabs who left Israel. They could have been integrated into the surrounding countries. Instead, they were kept in camps and told that they had to destroy Israel. They had to have a right of return. They had to go back. That history can't stop and you can't move forward. You have to only move backward. So the sole fault for the refugees was the attack by the Arab countries designed to kill Israelis. That's when the expulsions and the leavings occurred. And so Alan, before I go, before I go to back to leadership, before I go yeah. back to Norman uh, for response to that, yeah. from your understanding, how many Jewish people were displaced from their homes in this early period? Because I've heard it was you know, actually a lot. It was between seven and eight hundred thousand, with probably a trillion dollars worth of wealth. These were people who had lived in these countries longer than the Muslims. They had lived there since the Babylonian exile, uh, two thousand years earlier. They had been full citizens. They were dimis. They were second class because they were not not Muslims. But they lived in peace. And once this happened. Uh, many were expelled. Some left voluntarily. I can see that to uh, Mr. Finkelstein. But many left. About the same number were left voluntarily. Remember, too, with the Arabs, they were told to leave and they would come back victorious after. In Haifa, for example, many of them wanted to stay and many did stay. But the Arab leadership said, leave. We'll come back victorious. You'll have everything back. This is a complex situation. It's 75 years ago. There is a statute of limitations on things like this, a moral statute of limitations. Move on. Establish yourselves in the countries that you left and went to. Get rid of these refugee camps. Get rid of UNRWA. And it's UNRWA for one, and and number two. So you see what he's trying to do? He's trying to tell the Palestinian people, forget about the past, forget about your history, and just move on. Where does that rhetoric sound familiar? Where have we heard that before, ladies and gentlemen? Haven't we heard people say the same kind of phrases here in the United States to certain groups here in the United States? Move on, forget about the past, move forward. Let's not talk about that. That's to make the people who occupied you and the people who oppressed you feel comfortable. Become full citizens of the countries you moved to the way my grandparents became full citizens of the United okay. States. Let me, let me go after to... pogroms had made them leave Poland. Okay, uh, come to Norman Finkelstein, your response to that. Okay, thank you, Piers. First of all, as a general point, I agree with the notion of a statute of limitations on your claims to a parcel of land 
The first time I came across that expression was reading Arnold Toynbee's great history of the history of the world, actually. And he makes the point in his history that isn't there a statute of limitation on the claims of Jews to Palestine? He said that claim was made 2,000 years ago. And it's claimed that, even today it's claimed that, based on what happened 2,000 years ago, there's a large portion of Israeli population who believes they have title to the West Bank, they have title to Gaza, because of that claim 2,000 years ago. Isn't there a I statute of limitations? Allow me to complete my thought, and then you can disagree. Isn't there a statute of limitations on the claim from two to 3,000 years ago? Now, yeah. I want to focus on Gaza. I, want, I would like to focus on Gaza. The population is expelled from Israel into Gaza. Now, if you look at Benny Morris's history called Border Wars, he says that between 1949 and 1953, literally, listen closely, about 2,700 to 5,000 Palestinian expellees that's including in the West Bank and in Gaza. Between 2,700 and 5,000 Palestinian expellees were killed by Israel when they tried to return home. Now, Benny Morris says 90% of those killed were unarmed. They were yep. what he called economic infiltrees who wanted to see their homes. Now, let's pause here for a second. The killing of unarmed people. Where does that sound familiar? Didn't we just see a guy on the news, or I, I saw on social media actually, uh, was shot by the police and he was unarmed? Remember, the police in the United States, they got their training from the IDF in Israel. So you see how they have similar tactics, shooting unarmed people? They wanted to see their land they wanted to see their neighbors. They were brutally, if you believe Professor Morris, brutally murdered between those years. In 1956, as you know, peers, England, France, and Israel invaded Egypt, including at the time, Gaza. Okay. What happened then? According to Benny Morris <clears throat> in the book Border Wars, he said between 470 and 500 Palestinian men were lined up and shot down. Now let's bear in mind, Piers, this is long, long before this entity called Hamas came into the picture. Now if we fast forward to 1967, after Israel occupies Gaza, there are new assaults on the people of Gaza, this time carried on by, at the time, defense, no, he wasn't defense, agricultural minister, Ariel Sharon. Now, without getting sidetracked, I do have to say, Professor Dershowitz, every time I listen to you, even when we debated each other, in 2003, I guess, or 2004, I can't recall. You keep escalating your claims about having written UN Resolution 242 or contributed to the resolution. Professor Dershowitz, mm -hmm. I understand people have fantasies and I understand that people have failings of memory as they get older. But Professor Dershowitz, when we had our original debate you didn't even know who wrote UN Resolution 242. You had all these names. It was Lord Carradine. Anybody who was involved in the process would know that. So let's, make, let's agree on one thing. We both, both of us, should agree to only state facts. And if we have any doubts about the facts, let's set them aside and try to give viewers listeners as accurate a record as possible we can do
Let's pause for just a second. It's really funny because, uh, uh, yeah, I don't think he was expecting Norm to go there. But, yeah, it's just like Alan Dershowitz lies a lot. But there's something else here I want to add as well. Notice the examples that Norm gave. Those were things that happened to the Palestinian people prior to the creation of Hamas. So the point that needs to be made there is that everybody keeps saying this started October 7th, which I told you that is not the case. And then when you bring up the history of it, Zionists like Alan Dershowitz will be like, well, they, they came after Israelis first. And, and, and so that's why they had to be occupied and to protect and, and to keep Israelis safe. But Norm just gave you multiple examples of atrocities that happened to the Palestinian people prior to Hamas. So what was the reason then? Alan will go on to, to make up some stuff, I disagree. though. disagree. But when you engage in your fantasies, it really, to me, is very disturbing and disorienting. Okay. Well, let me ask <laughs> Professor Dershowitz to, to, to respond. Well, first of all, let's get the facts straight. I was Arthur Goldberg's law clerk. Arthur Goldberg was the United States representative to the United Nations. He asked me to come down. I actually moved in with him at the Waldorf Astoria Towers and work with him on, on 242. Yes, I confused the name Carrington with something else, but I worked closely. In fact, I was partly Lord responsible for Carradine. changing the words. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I worked on the matter. I didn't work with Lord Carradine. I worked with Arthur Goldberg. And so you lied. <laughs> uh, I still think he lied about Epstein too, you guys. I still think when he was on Kim Iverson's show, I think he was lying about that too. Together, we managed to get rid of the word Palestinian before refugees in order to make sure that the resolution applied both to Palestinian refugees and Here's, to this is Jewish pure refugees. Science fiction, which well, I can easily prove. Now you're, interu now you're mm -hmm. interrupting me. So let me finish. This is a detail. Uh, it's a fact. Now let's talk about what happened involving the Gaza Strip. I agree there's a statute of limitations. I'm opposed to any biblical claims on Israel. I believe Israel has a, a political and moral claim to the land. There have always been Jews living there from the time of Jesus and Mohammed to 1948. And wisely, the British decided for a compromise plan for, for division. And that plan was accepted by the Jewish and Zionist leaders. It was rejected by the Palestinians. And then, as you know, Israel tried to give the entire Gaza Strip over to Egypt, back to Egypt, during the Camp David Accords. It almost caused a <laughs> breakdown in the Camp David meetings because the Egyptians didn't want it. And Israel very reluctantly held on to it. And then in 2005, Israel abandoned the Gaza. And only when rockets and a bloody coup occurred did Israel respond by having border controls. Let me tell you one thing. They weren't strong enough. If there had been better border controls, Hamas would not have been allowed to bring in concrete, which it used to build tunnels, to bring in weapons, which it used to murder all these people on October 7th. So Israel was not strong enough. It should have had far better border controls as other countries had in comparable situations. Netanyahu actually like literally funded Hamas. Literally funded Hamas. And so one more point, Toynbee and, and, and Benny Morris both are regarded as kind of one-sided uh, 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 historians. There are claims uh, uh, that dispute both of them, particularly Toynbee. Toynbee was an overtly anti-Zionist historian who didn't believe that the Jewish people had any claim uh, to Israel. There's also a statute of limitations on that. And so let's move forward. And moving forward means potentially uh, a solution where Hamas is no longer in control of Gaza. Uh, remember, too, you're absolutely right, Norman. Uh, terrorism began way before Hamas. Terrorism was an essential part of the Palestinian leadership. The U.S., the Olympic uh, 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 massacres that occurred way before Hamas. Uh, the, the, the terrorism on airplanes, the blood. See how he's smearing Arabic people? You see, you see what he's doing, how he's putting that smear out there? 
to scare people and tell people that they're they were all always terrorists and stuff like that but see if it was the other way around and if you made those types of statements about israelis you would be called anti-semitic but you see how he can just sit up there and smear arabic people going up of airplanes the hijacking of airplanes the problem is that the world rewarded terrorism and it's rewarding them again um, by allowing Hamas to free uh, n hundreds of okay. people, legitimately many convicted, and not all convicted, many convicted, in exchange for a small number of completely innocent hostages. You can't compare completely innocent hostages with convicted murderers. Okay. Look, Norman, respond to that, but also, uh, I also want to move yes, on, yes. Once, you've once you've responded to it, also move on, if, if you will, to the issue of settlements, because one of the things I find hardest to have any sympathy with Israel about is the continued expansion of settlements. I agree. Uh, and in particular on the West Bank, and I think we may find some consensus here. But first of all, Norman, your response yeah. to uh, what Alan Dershowitz just said, but also then move it to settlements. Yeah, well, I would like to try to, you know, well, actually I can bring it up to the settlements uh, on the case of Gaza. So I would like to just continue where I left off with, so to speak, at the risk of being boring, the timeline. And uh, I said in 1970, there were uh, atrocities committed in Gaza against the people of Gaza by the uh, agriculture, the head by the agricultural minister at the time, Ariel Sharon. In 1987, as you perhaps remember, Piers, the first intifada broke mm -hmm. out. It was overwhelmingly, here I quote Benny Morris from his book, Righteous Victims, it was an overwhelmingly nonviolent civil resistance to the Israeli occupation. Yeah, I heard that too, Spark Joy. Somebody is eating potato chips. I was like, is someone opening like a candy wrapper or something? I heard that too. By 1990, three years after the beginning, or really two years, because it began on December 7th, 1987, by 1990, Israel started to institute, again, I'm sticking strictly to Gaza, what it called a closure policy. And the closure policy was basically to seal off Gaza. Okay? By 2002, 2003, if you read uh, Baruch Kimmerling, he was a senior sociologist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, he described Gaza as, quote, the largest concentration camp ever. Yep. Now, you might say Baruch Kimmerling was a person of the left, and I will grant that. But then we have Giora Island. Giora Island at the time was the head of Israel's National Security Council. He said in March 2003, and now I'm quoting him, he described Gaza as a huge concentration camp. So you can say there is a consensus among knowledgeable people, sociologists at the Hebrew University, head of the National Security Council, that Israel had turned Gaza into a concentration mm -hmm. camp. In 2006, in 2006, there is an election in January 2006. Hamas wins the election basically on the platform of reform because the Palestinian Authority is proverbially corrupt. It comes into power. Immediately as it comes into power, Israel institutes this brutal economic blockade on Gaza. Yep. And at that point, uh, uh, there have been various descriptions. I'm sure, Piers, you wouldn't disagree. You wouldn't call The Economist a left-wing magazine or anti-Semitic. It described Gaza as, quote, a toxic dump. Yep. And uh, at that point, it had a high, it, slowly, just to give you one example, Piers, and your listeners, because they should have a sense of what this blockade looked like. Israel's explicit policy, its explicit policy was to keep Gaza on the precipice of economic catastrophe. That's how they described their policy. They prohibited baby chicks from entering Gaza. They pr prohibited chocolate from entering Gaza. They prohibited potato chips from entering Gaza. They pr pr prohibited any spices 
from entering Gaza. And, but they didn't prevent this potato chip. Look at uh, Al Alan Dershowitz's face. Look at the expression on his face. Isn't this scary? It's kind of scary. You know, he, he actually, his eyes lit up like that when Norm started to mention potato chips. And it prohibited any exports from Gaza, except at some points, occasionally, things like strawberries. So what had happened to Gaza? It had, on the eve of 2007, it had the highest unemployment rate in the world. It was about 60% unemployed, 50% uh, for the population as a whole, 60% for youth. The people in Gaza were left to languish and die. No past, no present, no future. future. To languish and die in the concentration camp. That was their prospect as of October 6, 2003. Excuse me, yeah, 2023. Sorry about that. May I respond? Well, I tell you what, May yes, I I see, I, I see on that point, Professor Dershowitz. Yeah, we're going to move on to the uh, West Bank. Uh, oh, where did I? Oh, 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 yes. This part right here, name me one intentional body. This part is very important. Um, don't play here. I'd like you to one do. Sentence, what is it? What are, me. Are you, okay, give me one sentence, but then please address the issue one of settlements. One sentence. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, a thousand humanitarian and economic organizations have all reached the same conclusion. It's very simple. The main cause of the disaster in Gaza is Israel's illegal blockade of that parcel of land. Full stop. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's false. Who's wrong? Who's wrong? Unk, that is That's wrong. Rose. The World Bank the, the, the is wrong. Blockade, the International the Monetary the blockade, Fund is wrong. They're yes, all wrong. Yes. Are yes, they all anti-Semitic? Yes, is that what's going on? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. They're wrong. But it was coming. So notice how when he's referring to all those organizations, any organization or any person that criticizes uh, Israel, they're always wrong, according to Zionists. You have your information incorrect. You misunderstood. They're trained to push back on this. So you mean to tell me the UN and all these organizations are incorrect, but you're right? I happen to know so more why about are they the all law wrong? than any of them. That, because the blockade was completely lawful. It was designed to prevent the importation and then the use of rockets okay. against Israel. It's perfectly lawful so for a country to engage every, in a blockade. Every, every, that is, okay. you're not, let me finish. You okay. can't have a double, Look, Israel Dershowitz. is exposed to a double standard, but Professor we're not letting Dershowitz. you impose a double standard on me. No, I'm going to finish my statement and you're not going to interrupt me. Potato got angry. So understand me, the, 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 the military occupation was lawful. The blockade was lawful. Every country has the right to defend itself from rockets, from terror tunnels, from people coming over the border, murdering and kidnapping people. Those are all lawful. I'm telling you that as an expert in international law and the law of war. Okay. If you want to dispute me, get an expert who knows something about an international law. Okay. Not a how is this guy an expert in everything? You were Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer. You claim to be an expert in international law. You also claim to be some type of historian. How are you? An, no one is an expert in everything. But Alan Dershowitz apparently was everywhere at every time with everyone and is an expert in everything. Make it make sense, people. Not, Fine. not a polemicist Professor, like Professor you. Professor Dershowitz, okay. Professor Dershowitz, just as a matter of fact, I teach the laws of war. I've been teaching it yeah, for the last five years. Yeah, but you don't know To my, to yeah, my, uh, to my understanding. You're, you're biased. You're, prof okay, Professor Dershowitz. Okay, Professor Dershowitz. Let's so he teaches something, but Alan Dershowitz said, yeah, you teach it, but you don't know anything about it. Everybody is wrong except for the Zionists. Does everybody, f you see this now? Everyone is wrong except for them. I disagree. I'm completely ignorant. Let's take that as a point of departure. How does it come to be 
yes. that every humanitarian and political body in the world has declared that the blockade of Gaza constitutes collective punishment and therefore is a violation, a breach of international law, a war crime under international law. How did that come to pass? They're wrong. How is it that you, first of every, all, you're wrong. I, they're all you're, wrong. No, you're not, they're all you're not wrong. right. Except you're Alan not Dershowitz. Right. No, no, no. Except you're wrong. Sir, you're wrong sir, in describing. Professor you're, Dershowitz. You're wrong in describing name, name every one, group. There are many name groups. Name me one. Okay. Professor Dershowitz, name me one legal, international yeah. legal body or human rights organization. Name me one. I'll take the pause. Name me one. That what? That says the blockade of Gaza is not Compl uh, collective punishment. Name me one. The law, the lawfare project in the United States. Um, the law, the, uh, the lawfare uh, uh, project. I said, name me the, one the, international the, legal or political body. It is. One. It is. Everybody's no, it is an listening now. Legal body. Here's Morgan it's has a very large audience. Name me one. Name me international, one international look. or legal legal or political body that says. The, the blockade of Gaza is legal. Name me one. It, it, it is me legal. One. And every, or, every organization that I have been associated with, the Lawfare Project, the project run I by a woman that. named Leitner, and I it's a national that. project, were yeah. all, all, have all concluded I, that the blockade I is said legal. One also, legal or the Israeli Supreme body. The, let, let, me, let me finish. The Israeli Supreme Court, which is above reproach, and which is much fairer than the International Court of Justice, has also, with limits, has said that blockades designed to prevent the bringing of rockets to Israel is lawful. Also, of course, the, the Israeli Supreme Court is going to protect the Israeli people, you dummy. Of course, that's going to happen. Of course, the Israel Supreme Court is going to agree with the blockade. That's just like having Israel investigate itself. Those things should be independent and should come from outside. Now listen to what he says about the ICJ. This is interesting. Use your common sense. What possible reason would there be for allowing a, 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 a group in Gaza, a group of Hamas, to send rockets without trying to blockade them from bringing the rockets in and building tumbles? Use your common sense. Of course it's unlawful. Okay. Every country in the world would do exactly the same as Israel okay, did. Okay, listen, I think, we've, I think we've exhausted this part this of the debate. From being I do want to, before we run out of time, we, we only have about five minutes left, and I, I do want to get into sure. settlements. And I, I'll start with you, Professor Finkelstein. The, the issue of settlements, I think, is, is pretty much indefensible, actually, what's been going on, and particularly in recent years uh, on the West. We're going to no, of the course point. not. They are not war crimes at all. They are disputes over what constitutes the UN resolution 242. But if the UN which says they're illegal, the UN says they're illegal. Where does that leave it? The UN says a lot of things. The UN, if you, it, the UN also called Israel Zionism racism. The so hold on to that part right there, because let me tell you what this, what he's actually saying. When he said the Israel Supreme Court is above reproach. And now he tells you, well, the UN says a lot of things are illegal. What he is really saying to you is that when it comes down to war crimes, they're talking about the settlements. I skipped you that part for sake of time. When they're talking about war crimes, when they're talking about those illegal settlements, et cetera, all the things that are happening to the Palestinian people, what he's telling you is that Israel is above all of those organizations. Israel is above the UN. They're above the ICJ, which he says in this debate that he said the ICJ is actually not legitimate. Uh, again, nothing is legitimate when they're criticizing Israel. Um, so he goes on to mention those things. He's telling you that Israel, what they decide to do in Israel is above everything and every other organization and is above international law. And that is what he's telling you. And that's what I want you to write down and take home with you and pass on to your friends, because that is incredibly dangerous. We have heard this type of rhetoric before. And we cannot go back to a space like that. Israel needs to be dismantled. People have to put the state of Israel in its place. And I, I don't know what's going to happen after this war in Gaza, but I will say one thing.
The world now has its eyes on the state of Israel and the world is now able to see that Israel has been getting away with things that none of these other neighboring countries to Israel would be able to get away with and how incredibly dangerous the Israeli government has become, not just to the Palestinian people, to, but to the entire world. This is why Nicaragua has gone to the ICJ. That's why South Africa started this in the beginning and went to the ICJ. They have put Israel's behavior on the international stage during a time of social media. The UN has no authority to define international law. The UN can who, give who advisory does? opinions. But, who does? But all but let, 15 me, let me let me please are the ICJ. let me finish. So remember who appoints the justices. Countries appoint the justices. So when Lebanon appoints a justice, it's Hezbollah is appointing the justice. The International Court of Justice is an illegitimate court. It is not a real court. But I want to get to the court. See? You see that? Point. What Thomas Finkelstein Bergenthal. finally says. Thomas but wait a minute. Let me pause for a second. We'll get back to this. If the ICJ is an illegitimate court, according to Alan Dershowitz, are they an illegitimate court when it comes to Russia? Are they an illegitimate court when it comes to Russia and Ukraine? Because this is the same type of talking point that John Kirby will make, the State Department will make, is that, yeah, well, the ICJ said that, but we're not going to change anything that we do differently here in reference to Israel. It's the ICJ. They actually can't enforce anything. That's what the State Department told you. However, when the ICJ ruled against Russia and the actions that Russia was doing, all of a sudden the ICJ is legitimate. It's only illegitimate when they're criticizing Israel. Let me finish, the please. American Let me finish. Said Let the me finish. Are illegal. When, what Finkelstein, what what Finkelstein is finally saying, is that these people he called them martyrs. I was at Beira. I was at the Nova Music Festival. I saw the remnants of where a woman uh, named Vivian Silver, a peacenik, who used to go over and bring Hamas and 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 and, and Gazan people to hospitals was burnt to death. I saw where people were raped. There is no justification for collective rape. There is no justification for murdering a peacenik. This woman- If he feels there's no justification for that, then why was he Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer? Why were you hanging out on Epstein's island? And by the way, they keep repeating the same talking point. That talking point has been debunked multiple times. The New York Times has had to retract that article because there was no evidence for those claims. This is the same guy that was Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer. This is the same guy that defended Jeffrey Epstein on Kim Iverson's show. That's who Alan Dershowitz hung out with on Epstein's island. You have no room. This guy has no room to talk about that. None whatsoever because we see who your friends are did you say that to jeffrey epstein allen did you say that to him did you tell epstein that what he was doing to those little girls was a fucking problem did you tell him that allen i don't think so it was probably murdered by the very people she brought to hospitals because they knew exactly where she lived and where the hospitals. It's an abomination to even suggest that any kind of martyrdom, dispute over land, dispute over any, could justify what happened on October 7th. Shame on anybody who thinks that civilized human beings should be praised or even justified for doing what they did. I met a man whose son had been beheaded and Hamas then took his head, brought it back to Gaza, put it on sale for $10,000, and this father had to bury his son without a head. I don't believe half the things that this guy is saying. Again, a lot of these things have not been proven. Norm responds to whether or not he will actually condemn those people. I think this is important part. Well, we're gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll end with Norma Finkelstein's response and answer that question. My, I think it's a legitimate question. My my response is exactly the same one I gave you the very first time I met you, Pierce. There were atrocities, large atrocities that occurred on October 7th. 
I think it's indisputable. You then asked me, would you consider it terrorism? I then replied to you, I think atrocities denote terrorism. Mm -hmm. However, I said I take the same attitude towards the perpetrators of those atrocities as, I, as the abolitionists in the United States took towards the Nat Turner Rebellion. Nat Turner, the So you justify them, so you praise them, so you Allow glorify them, and you honor them. That's Pierce, the reality. Pierce, Pierce, can I finish? Yeah. Can I finish? Yeah. Uh, Nat Turner and the slave revolt committed horrible atrocities. The ab abolitionists said horrible things happened, but they never condemned Turner. No, they Nat don't Turner. happen. They what are they perpetrated what they by did people. Was, You're justifying they, what they did Shame was, on Finkelstein, allow me to finish. This is the lowest point Pierce, you've ever please gotten tell them to, to stop. and you've gotten to low well, points, well, but this is the lowest Pierce, point you've Pierce, gotten to, please, comparing these Pierce, rapists oh, please and tell these murderers to, well, I think to let him, abolitionists I think Alan, Alan, is finish, the lowest point in your uh, history. Let him finish what he's trying to say. You were friends with one. You were friends with a guy who basically was running Thanks. a sex trafficking sure. ring. Thank okay, you. Let me By the way, word. Nat Turner's rebellion, okay, in Nat Turner's rebellion, they committed horrible atrocities, including beheading babies. That's a fact. However, the and abolitionists- And you're justifying that. They did and you're not, justifying that. They did not. Please, Pierce, can you please tell him to I think stop? let him finish the point he's making and then, then he respond. Okay, thank you, thank you okay. so much. However, the abolitionists did not condemn the perpetrators. The abolitionists kept saying, we told you so. We told you so. We told you so. If you treat people like that, what happened with the slave revolt inevitably would happen. And I say, if you lock two million people in a concentration camp, for 20 years, half of whom are children who were born into that concentration camp, don't react with shock and dismay and disbelief and indignation at what happened on October 7th. I have well, spent I the last react. 20 I, years, I, I have spent the last 20 years of my life studying what's been done to the people lying. of Gaza. And each time I reread what I wrote, I'm more, more firm than ever before. I will not condemn those people, even as I acknowledge that massive, unspeakable atrocities occurred on October 7th. Okay. And that was, yeah, that was the mic drop moment right there, because that's really what it comes back home to, right? Is the fact that this is what happens when you occupy people and you oppress people. And what does international law say about that? It says that they have the right to resist. Not only do they have the right to resist, but they have a right to an armed resistance. That's international law. I didn't write the law, but that is what it says. So that's important to note. Alan Dershowitz, uh, again, these people are paid propagandists. So I'm going to bring this up and tell you what this comes back to. Thank you, Eric, so much for sharing this. This is well uh, put here. We always got to bring this back to MCDS, money, corruption, demands, and solutions. So this is Eric's thing that he came up with. When this particular situation on Israel and Gaza, go to the MCDS framework. Money, the M, the money situation in reference to Israel, Gaza, you have to remember it's a genocidal land grab and has been for 75 plus years. You know about the resources that are along the Gaza coast. So you have to remember that there is resources there. C for corruption, rich Zionists bribe Congress and the presidents into supporting them. This goes back to the Israeli lobby. That's the corruption piece. Then you bring in demand, demand an end to the corruption, and then you bring in solution. Do the hard work of getting big money out of politics and government and do it now. That's the MCDS in reference to Israel and Gaza. It all leads back to the money. And this is why we need corporate money out of electoral politics. So these politicians are bought and paid for. There was a, a time in this country where that was not the case. 
So you got to bring it back to that. And you have to understand again, what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal for Israel is not just to cleanse the area. Everybody's getting that part for the most part, but it's to grab the land. And you can't grab the land if the people are still on it. So we always have to remember that folks. They're not letting certain foods come into Gaza because they don't actually want more generations to actually thrive and be built in Gaza. They don't want that. This is why they couldn't have the olive trees. This is why they couldn't have the spices. They don't want them to have a future. They want the people gone. And for people who say, well, no, it's just because of Hamas, that's why. What's the excuse for kicking the people out of their homes in the West Bank and building the illegal settlements? Always bring it back to that. I'll go to some of the comments here. That was a great debate. Gilbert said, I'm surprised they haven't asked Allen and Epstein in this interview about, Al about Epstein. Yes. Thank you, P.S., the poor little Epstein girls who had to be with Al, allegedly, we have to say, because we don't know that. Uh, Eric, Russia, Poland, France, and Germany has plenty of land for a new Israel. Thank you, Goba. Alan Dushovitz. Thanks, Sparky. Make Israel Syria again. In those Ottoman Empire days, Levant Jews got along fine with their neighbors, whether Muslim, Christian, or otherwise. And thank you, Tony D. Mansion and Cinema ran USA 2020 to 2022, then Trump and Israel from 2022 to 2024. Biden is a tool. I'll take the comments on Rockfin. Thank you. Thank you for the tip on Rockfin Hemp. Uh, 9-11 was in the past. We want to look forward. Let every murderer out of jail that was in the past, forgive, forget, and move on. That's what we have with war criminals and why they keep on killing. And thank you for this as well. The U.S. officially and rightfully labeled the Igran, excuse me, the Ergun and stern gang terrorists. They did drive bys, bomb tons of markets and hid guns in synagogues. The USA then negotiated with them, gave them nuclear weapons, and one became prime minister of the illegal apartheid rogue nation of US Ray Hell. Thank you for that. 